Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is an author with projects across multiple genres, bringing colorful characters to life in his comedic and witty style. His debut fiction writing news is depicted in his book, Branded, the most notorious cattle rustler of our time. Before becoming an author, he plied his talents in IT and construction project management with an array of major commercial projects. He plans to retire and write evocative and attention-grabbing novels. Welcome to Authors Over 50, John Armour. Thank you, Julia. Glad to be here. We're glad to have you, John. Our opening question on authors over 50 is always, so what took you so long to write your first book? Well, the book, uh, uh, I met this guy that I wrote this book about uh, in 1999 and 2000 uh, through 2001. So it's been uh, a little over 20 years since since the events. Um and during that time, uh, you know, I've had uh, family, kids, career, um, and, uh, you know, I've had a yearning to be a novelist uh, my entire life, uh, but this book kind of pushed me over the edge for that. So I collected uh, things over the years on this guy and his story uh, and my own personal uh, experiences with him. And I uh, intended to write a biography. So uh, that that kind of went sideways about five years in. I didn't really like the uh, biographies. I didn't like writing them, doing the research. So I converted it over to a fiction novel. And uh, uh, from there on, it, it it went a lot smoother over the last three and a half, four years of writing this project. Um, and uh, I was able to uh, exude a lot more creativity and embellish a lot more and kind of play God, you know, with the characters. So um, what took me so long was, uh, was a lot of uh, uh, just personal things going on in my life with career and family and stuff, you know, uh, life interrupted, so to speak. So uh, finally got all those things out of the way, and now I'm able to focus on, on some writing. Well, tell us a little bit more about your inspiration, this notorious cattle rustler. Well, Bob is, uh, he's a very colorful character. He has a very good sense of humor. He's always joking about everything. He joked himself all the way to jail, I believe. So um, he was a neighbor of mine, and I hooked up with him uh, trying to find a horse uh, to uh, have at my daughter's birthday party on a weekend and had a lot of doors slammed in my face. Uh, People don't tend to like to lend $500,000 horses, so. Uh, stumbled upon his wife in a driveway uh, down a long road to his ranch and talked to her for a few minutes. She took my number and told me her husband would call, and he never did. Uh, I woke up in the morning, and I found a horse tied up to my front porch eating my bushes. So um, he was very generous from the start. Uh, we used the horse for the party. Uh, he came, got it, or he sent a ranch hand to get it at the end of the day, and then uh, it took me about another two weeks to get to know him or to to pin him down and, and thank him for the horse and try to give him some money. He didn't, he wouldn't take anything for it, but uh, you know, so from that point on, we just kind of bonded on some things that he needed to have done at his ranch. And I just worked for him for a bit uh, for that two year period. And uh, he taught me how to ride horses, rope cattle, rope calves, men fences and do, you know, ranch work. So that was kind of exciting for me, not ever having been exposed to any of that. So uh, that's, that's kind of my inspiration is, is I loved, uh, I loved the ranch. I loved the horses, the animals, 
Uh, I love working the cattle. Uh, I just love the whole the whole outdoor atmosphere. So uh, that was the inspiration for writing this story. Uh, after he got caught, you know, he's a kind of a bad bad boy cowboy, you know. So that was kind of intriguing to me. So that's that's kind of uh, where I started. Well, how did you determine the plot for the book? Well, the plot is 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 basically his life. Um, you know, from the time he was a teenager up to the time he was captured at 38 years old um, and uh, and given 14 life sentences. So oh, wow. the plot just kind of takes care of itself. Um, and uh, originally when I started to do the biography, I did a timeline and everything. And, a lot, you know, I had, to, I had to go through and research a lot of different time periods in his life and stuff. And that was just way too frustrating for me. Um, I'm not a researcher. And I, uh, I, I kind of use the timeline, you know, in my novel, uh, you know, to help build the story and, and carry the story through. But essentially I just threw everything I had as a biography out the window and started from scratch. So. Well, what did he think about you writing this book? Uh, he loves it and he's getting a lot of attention, which he's not supposed to be, but, uh, <laughs> He's uh, he's spreading the word around, you know, in in the jails, you know, for for other inmates to buy the book and so forth. And uh, he's excited about it. He's read it. Um, you know, when I first started this project with him, uh, he wanted me to make him look like a good guy. And yeah. I kind of explained to him that, you know, there's nothing I could write that's going to make you look like that. People are going to believe what they've already read in the newspapers, um, you know, so he was good with that. He understood it, and I told him, you know, I've, I've converted this to a novel, so um, and, a, and a piece of fiction. So, you know, I'm going to embellish quite a few things, and I really don't think it matters what people think of you here on this earth right now. They know that they know what kind of a guy you are by reading the newspaper. Um, you know, it's it's what you know, it, it's what your maker is going to think of you when you get there. So, I, uh, uh, you know, that was my original intent and inspiration for contacting him about this book was to kind of turn him to God. But uh, I think he's already there. He's been there. And uh, so he really doesn't have a care what people think about him here on this earth and what he's done as long as he's right with, you know, with his maker. So. Well, once you wrote this book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to use a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? Um, I self-published. So, I mean, that experience was, uh, uh, you know, through Amazon and, uh, and Ingram Spark. Uh, so I've, <clears throat> I've chosen that route because I feel like, uh, you know, they're, they're probably the two of the largest uh, book publishers in the world. And it's a good place to start. So uh, that's kind of what led me to, to choose that platform for my publishing. What about challenges with that? I know that's a learning curve to, to learn how to do all of that yourself as far as formatting and editing. Did you get outside help with those issues? Yes, I did. Um, I, uh, I used a, uh, I hired an editor, professional editor, um, who was uh, very experienced in the industry and worked for some large publishing houses um, and then uh, took off on her own and started her own business. So um, that that's the route I went for my editing, uh, uh, developmental editing, line editing, copy edit. She she did everything all the way through. So um, I had some consistency, uh, you know, in in the product all the way from beginning to end uh, by utilizing her. So I, I think I thought that was very important to to get that consistency amongst one editor. I know sometimes uh, people when they publish books they. I start out with one editor and maybe they have some animosity because of all the red marks they receive back and they jump to somebody else or, uh, or that person's schedule fills up and they can't get them back. You know, they can't get them back as, as their editor and they have to move on to someone else. But I was, uh, I was blessed in, in the sense that I could, uh, uh, she was excited about the project and wanted to continue on too. So I was, I was blessed that she wanted to continue with the project. What about your cover? Who designed your cover? Um, I designed the cover, and uh, actually, the cowboy artwork on the front of it is actually Bob Harold Leach's artwork that he did in, in jail. So he did the piece, he sent it to me, and uh, I turned it into a portion of the cover for the book. Very nice. Well, I know there are a lot of people who are considering self-publishing and just wonder if it's a process that's easily learned, or does it take a lot more work? Can you kind of 
give them the the highs and the lows of self-publishing? Well, you do have to do quite a bit of work yourself. And, and the Amazon and Ingram Spark platforms are not particularly user friendly. So um, it was a, you know, for me, I get frustrated and I'm a jack of all trades. So, you know, I'll try something. I want to move on to something else, try something, move on to something else. So it frustrates me to have to spend a whole lot of time on any one thing uh, and uh, trying to figure things out. Uh, this social media platforms are a nightmare for a guy my age to try to navigate uh, or anybody over 50, I think. Um, and, and I'm actually over 60. So, you know, Instagram and Facebook are, uh, you know, I, I have to go find a kid to, to figure out how to use them. So, um, so that's, that's a, a frustrating, those are frustrating platforms for me. Um, and, uh, just navigating, uh, you know, all of the, uh, uh, the requirements, uh, in Amazon to publish, self-publish the, the format of the book and the cover and all of that stuff. Um, uh, I did it and I was always grasping somebody off to the side, you know, to, you know, help me out, help me. I, you know, I don't understand this, but after a while, uh, you really, you find out that people really don't want to help you. They just want to, they just want to steer you toward another internet article or another, you know, Google it or whatever. It doesn't seem like uh, I'm, I'm old enough to know that I'm, I'm hands-on learning. I'd like someone to teach me and show me. I'm from the show me state originally, Missouri. So um, I like, I like to be shown what to do, not be, be told where to go to read about what to do. So um, that was a, a bit frustrating, but uh, I got through it, figured it out. Uh, told myself to slow down and just take it one step at a time. And, uh, and I think that's, that's important advice for anybody trying to navigate those platforms is just take it one piece at a time. You don't have to read everything. You don't have to know everything. Uh, uh, but I've found that most of the sites where they've sent me for help, uh, they're either outdated and they don't apply to a constantly moving platform or, uh, you know, you're, you're calling some people and maybe asking some questions, you know, with Amazon or, or one of the publishing platforms. And usually they're very good about responding. So well, what about publicity? What have you done for publicity? Most writers enjoy the writing process, but we don't want to market or do publicity for our own work. Have you found anything that worked or maybe even something that didn't work? Well, Julia, I think you hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> Most of us don't want to do that that stuff. After you, you know, a lot of writers will write a book, they'll throw it out there on the self-publishing market, and then they'll say, Why isn't my book selling? Well, because you have to put as much work into marketing and publicity as you did writing the book. So um, and I think that's a shocker to a lot of people. It does you don't just throw it out on Amazon and people find it. Um yeah, uh, you know, you have to get out there and pound the pavement. Um and um, you know, basically I'm finding that I have to sell myself out to just about everybody I meet, uh, you know, to give a card, to explain the story, tell about the project or the book um, and get them excited. And I, I think that's, you know, just hitting the streets. That's, uh, that's a, a lot of what is still necessary to sell books these days, um, especially for somebody like me who's intimidated by the social media platforms of you know, you really don't know how they're working in the background. You don't really get any good diagnostic information back. Um, you know, there, are, there is some metadata that comes back. Uh, but, you know, to me that, you know, that data is not real useful. The data I want to see is book sold, book sold, book sold, you know, not, you know, how many people are looking at this and how many people are looking at that. So uh, for me, it's just getting out on the street and getting in front of people, setting up booths at every event that we can to, to market and sell the book. And I also uh, invested in a PR firm. So um, I feel like I have a very good PR uh, agent uh, out of Austin, <clears throat> PR by the book. And um, they have been very instrumental in, in making sure that my name and the book's name is out there and that they've gotten uh, me some coverage in, in various or different markets, uh, you know, across the United States that uh, are you know, either in my genre or just maybe, you know, a little bit. I think my book covers more than one genre, you know, Western is, is where, where I'm kind of pushing it, but it, it also goes into true crime, uh, you know, romance, um, you know, and, and probably across a couple of other, 
genres, but um, <clears throat> mainly Western genre. And they're, and they're pushing that for me in those markets and with those publications and magazines and news outlets. So that's, that's uh, I think that Anybody who wants to be ser a serious author or writer has to line themselves up with a good PR firm. Well, you're in two very popular genres. If you're in Westerns, since Yellowstone has become so popular and true crime is just really hot these days. Right. I don't know if it's because there's a lot of it. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, so. Yeah. Fortunately, and it's an easy target. Uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, it's on the forefront of the of the news every time you turn the TV on. So, uh, yeah, I, I can understand how it's gained popularity over the last couple of years or it's trending now. And the same with the Westerns and, and what uh, Yellowstone and 1883 and these other uh, <clears throat> other stories have uh, have portrayed over the last few years you know especially through the epidemic or the pandemic and everything you know people were latching on to the western genre and maybe the spaghetti westerns again you know might be coming making a comeback um i think it's cyclical now's the time to you know to jump on that kind of stuff if that's what you like to write um i want to write a, across uh you know various genres not just one um and a lot of other western authors have, have done that as well louis lamar he wrote across genres and James Patterson, he just grabs anything that's in the headlines and throws a book out in nine days, you know. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to be that guy. I guess that's, you know, they see that, and, and I guess I can see that too is very important, you know, as an author to make a living, um, you know, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm just wanting to, uh, you know, spend more time with one project than probably a lot of other authors would, but um, I feel like I, I need to, um, at least put a lot of quality and a lot of effort and time into making sure that, you know, my story is readable and that people have fun with it. Um, and it doesn't become some kind of a, you know, an example of some kind of literary flop, you know, or something like that. But, um, <clears throat> anyway, that's, that's kind of where I want to be in my writing is, is, uh, is writing exciting and, uh, engaging novels going forward. Well, it sounds like you've chosen the the best one that you could to begin with, a fascinating story. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the book and then read from it so that we can hear your tone and voice. Okay. Um, the book, Branded, uh, is the, the, the title comes from, uh, from uh, actually Branding Cows. Um, and in this case, uh, it's kind of a metaphor for what's happened to this guy, Bob, who's a main character in the story. So um, he's been branded by another guy named Diamond Jim. And uh, Diamond Jim is kind of an underworld figure who's kind of got his claws into cattle rustling and, you know, and just about any other enterprise really where he can make money. Because, you know, if you take a cow to the, to the market, you're going to get full price for it. If you take something to the pawn shop, you're going to get 10 cents on the dollar. So it's very lucrative business. And he had to have his hands in that. And he had his hands in, in selling or you know, distributing drugs all across the, the country. And uh, he, he and his father used, or Bob's father used him to distribute cattle medicines from ranch to ranch, you know, that were stolen and they made a lot of money that way too. So he had his hands in just about every kind of crime you can imagine, you know, the character Diamond Jim in the book. So, um, and he was an influence. Him and his daddy were influences on him in his career of crime, you know, all the way up until he got caught. So the SUV strains under Bob's control. He prays he can soon get off the highway. It look, he looks further down the road. DPS has a second line of patrol cars ahead. As he proceeds into the danger zone of cops set up across the bridge over the river, he realizes he can't keep moving toward them. They're half a mile thick. He's got to make a move or they will pepper him like Swiss cheese when he crosses the river. Bob slams on the brakes and puts the car into a smoky skid. Fumes from burning tire rubber and asbestos brake dust permeate the air behind him. Cops following him can't see now. They've driven right into Bob's smoke screen and, and slowed to a mere crawl, squinting hard through the thick smoke to ascertain the situation. Bob cuts the car to the left, across the grass and dirt median. More dust and dirt fly into the air. So anyway, that's just that's just an example of the opening scene, uh, and I start with a, a bit of action uh, with Bob. Um, and uh, this chase scene in the first chapter is a true story. Um, 
and uh, that that's kind of uh, how I start the book out, and that's how it ends is with his chase scene and him being <clears throat> him being uh, caught and mm. um, uh, and put back. In, so, well, that's serious business, especially here in Texas. Cattle rustling is very serious. Yeah, I think that uh, the, there's laws on the books that you can still be hanged for cattle wrestling. But ironically, uh, I don't think anybody has in a, a long time, and they never prosecuted Bob for cattle wrestling. They prosecuted him for uh, all of the other charges they had on him after he had escaped the Grayson County Jail with four other inmates and went on a rampage across North Texas. So um, he uh, he was charged with rape and uh, home invasion, uh, auto theft, uh Web, firearms charges, all kinds of things, but en enough that they they had fourteen life sentences on him, and they didn't feel like they needed to carry the cattle wrestling charges and waste the state's money uh, prosecuting him for that. So, wow, uh, he's the most notorious cattle rustler, but has never been prosecuted for it. So it's kind of fun. Was there anything that you edited out of the book that hit the cutting room floor? Uh, there's probably about a hundred, maybe 150 pages that hit the cutting room floor. I started out, uh, you know, when I, when I gave it to my editor, we had 1200 pages and we ended up at 600. So half the book was laying on the floor somewhere. And, and it's just a lot of material that is, you know, a lot of personal things, my interactions with him. Uh, a lot of that stuff we tried, you know, we, we tried to keep to a minute or cut out. So those are just kind of little stories I tell on the background, uh, you know. Uh, to support the books, but uh, uh, there are quite a few of them. So that's a lot of words. I hope you can use those in a another book one day. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps a backstory to this one. Uh, Do you have that in my mind? Do you have another book in you? Uh, not, uh, not a sequel to this right now. Um, I did leave it in that state where I could, you know, I could come back and and uh, and finish or. Uh, pick up where I left off and, and we could tell some more stories. Um, but um, I'm on to, I'm already on to another, another book project. So, um, uh, you know, I'll pick that story up later. What do you think was the best money you've ever spent as a writer? I'm going to have to say the editing, the editing, developmental editing is probably the, the best place you can spend your money is, getting the core of the book, getting the, you know, the developmental aspects of the book done and cleared up, you know, before you go on and, uh, you know, and a lot of things even change after that. But um, I think that's important to, um, uh, to have a good editor, to help you work through any developmental issues in your book. Um, and, and, and an editor that is, uh, that, that can carry through those concepts to, through editing the rest of the book into the line editing, copy edit and, you know, the finished product, um, you know, somebody that's engaged in that whole process, uh, a one editor deal is, you know, not jumping around from editor to editor. I know, I know some writers and even me, I was doing the same thing, uh, up front, uh, wasn't happy with the developmental editing in the process. Um, and threw the thing in the, on the shelf for a little while in frustration, uh, but then picked it back up and, uh, and changed some of the ways that I thought about writing and, and, and I picked back up and, and cleared all these comments. Uh, one of the interesting things is I had a female editor. So, um, a lot of her comments, I didn't quite understand. She was coming from a, from a female point of view and I really had to engage my wife to help me read these comments. Um, uh, and me ask my wife, what does she mean? What does she mean? You know, because it's only things that a woman might be able, might understand, and uh, so she helped me through those, and that was a bit that was a big help. I, you know, after after I let my wife read the comments and she read them back to me and tried to get me to understand things from a different point of view, I thought, aha, okay, now I know what she wants, and I was able to move on. So um, I really don't like to think I ever have writer's block. I just like to think that. Um, you know, I left some things rambling around in my brain and they're going to settle into a sentence or a paragraph or an idea or a thought at some point, you just got to give it time. You can't push it. And, and I know a lot of writers, uh, that, uh, you know, even write for public newspaper publications and things like that. It's gotta be, 
that's a harrowing experience, I think, to have to be held to deadlines because I don't think, I don't know that I could ever do that. But, um, you know, I've created deadlines for myself over and over and over again and pushed them every single time. So, um, you know, that, that's hard to be under pressure and write. Um, I, that's why I'm trying to take one project at a time. I don't like the pressure part of it. And uh, it is what it is. It'll, it'll come out when it comes out. I know. I'm always so amazed by these writers who have two or three different writing projects going on at the same time, you know, how they can keep their heads in each one. I can only do one at a time. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm the same. Does your family support your career as a writer? Absolutely. My wife is my biggest supporter and she's been amazing through this whole process. Um, and, uh, I, I couldn't have done any of this without her to tell you the truth. And, um, actually we just had a big party, a big book launch party here over the weekend. We had about a hundred or so people, um, family, friends, and, uh, and, uh, book fans. And, uh, uh, my wife was instrumental in helping put all of that together and is excited and, and is just as, as engaged in, in this as I am. So, um, I thank her for that support. Yeah. That's great. I think it does take a community. I think learning from other writers, going to writers retreats and conferences, taking classes, depending on our families to understand when, when we're, you know, deep in a project and can't come out to fix supper. My husband is eating a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches while I'm writing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, one of your questions is probably, you know, when is your best time of day to write? Um, uh, probably in the mornings, early in the mornings and get started and then I can go all day long. But if I try to start afternoon or in the afternoon, you might as well forget it. I, yeah. I can't, my day's done. I don't know other things. Um, so I have to start fresh and then I can stay through it, you know, sometimes all day, and sometimes all the way into the night, but and then sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with ideas and synopsises and I get up and write them down or I have my phone handy and I, you know, I put the thoughts down before I lose them. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think everybody has is different in, in, you know, when they write, how they write. I just feel like I have to be completely fresh. Uh, sometimes I'll sit around, I'll come up with an idea in the, in the evening. I have about 67 different synopsises that I've already put to paper. Um, wow. So when I think of a book idea, I don't just write down what I think would be the, a great title or a great thought. I, I actually dive into the synopsis right away so that I don't lose any of my initial thought. And then, then I have something good to work from, you know, later, but, um, well, you're going to be quite busy in your retirement if you've got 67 already ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't know if I'll ever finish those in my lifetime, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give them a shot now. Not all of my, not all of my publications I expect to be as big or as, as many pages as 600, you know, over 600, you know, I'm going to relax back into a, a 250, 275 page writing, you know, for a while and, uh, try to produce some, some quality stories, uh, that people can read. Yeah. That book is like two of, of mine. <laughs> That's a lot of, yeah, I, a lot of pages. A lot of pages, a lot of work, a lot of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Well, our last interview question is always: Our writers over fifty are a unique set. Do you have any advice for writers fifty and above? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it just depends on where you are in a in a career, or if if uh, you know. Obviously, most writers uh, over fifty are going to have another. I know the career they're either trying to pull back from or retire from, uh, you know, which is my case. And um, I've always wanted to be a novelist. So, you know, this is, this is where I, I picked up and, and started writing was, you know, at this late stage in life. And I have so many projects. Sometimes I don't feel like I'll ever get them all done and I probably won't, but I've learned not to let any of that intimidate me or the writing process, editing or anything. Just take your time, let things flow. Um, and talk to other people, talk to other writers and learn their experience uh, in publishing and, and, and mostly editing, because I think we're, we're first time or debut novelist. Uh, 
don't understand is is um, is the editing process and how bloody it might be. You know, if you've never gone through that, and I think it's that way even for experienced uh, writers. Uh, the developmental writing aspects um, are uh, you're never. It's, it, I, you know, I like to use a term called penimente, and it's it's where the artist paints over his previous work. You know, he doesn't like it, he paints over it, mm-hmm. and then he paints over that. And, you know, so so writing is much the same. I think is it's a process of layering. You know, your book, and and then you might come back and you might strike some things, you might paint over some things. Um, you know, so it's just it's 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 a creative process, and, and I think you have to take your time with a painting. And uh, and and love it and nurture it like a child. And um, um, to me, it's the only thing that can be on my mind is one subject, one book at a time. I can't think about more than more than one or you know one book. You know, I can't do the two or the three projects in motion all at the same time because I think it just deals away from my creativity that I would put into the one. Some people might be different, um, might be more multitasking, but um, I know multitasking destroys brain cells, so I try to stick with one thing at a time. Well, I just thank you so much for being with us today and for bringing such an intriguing project to life. I look forward to reading your book and and getting it out there for everybody else because I think it's a really fascinating subject and a, a fascinating man that you've captured there. So we just appreciate you so much and we're happy to say that you're now one of our authors over 50. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time on the show and uh, you can get this on amazon.com uh, Ingram spark. Um, it's also uh, the audible just came out last week and there's a uh, Kindle version as well. So. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like daily newspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.